morning, everybody. It's Friday, October 16th. Um, Charlie Fink here with This Week in XR, uh, my partner in crime, Ted Chilowitz, futurist at Paramount Pictures, and with us this week as our guest co-host, Amy LeMayer of the WXR Fund, uh, which is a venture capital firm that focuses on women-led business in XR. Um, Amy, welcome, and uh, thanks for making time for us this morning. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, so tell me, we were talking just before we went live about the investments that uh, WXR had made, and uh, I, I think people would be interested in hearing that, if, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. So uh, a couple of them that are particularly interesting is Absurd Joy. So that's um, part of the team from Alchemy Labs. Um, they did Job Simulator, which is still a huge hit in VR. I think it's still in the top five, or certainly top 10. And... Um, and they were acquired by Google back in 2017 and then uh, spun off to do this new company where they're um, developing games that will bring joy. And so they're in their development process right now and it's an iterative process and they're releasing openly throughout. Um, so definitely recommend checking them out. And then the, uh, another company I find really interesting is uh, Embodied Labs. So they're based out of LA and they're doing training that's focusing on the aging population and and what it's like to give care and interact with the aging population, which obviously is growing, growing market. And that started just focused on home health care, and it's expanded to companies, anyone that's interacting with the aging population, like Best Buy and their customer support center. So those are a couple of really interesting ones that we're, uh, uh, we've been working with and we're invested in. You guys are based here in LA. Um, I'm in San Francisco. My business partner, Martina, is in Seattle. Um, we do have some venture not partners. in LA at all but at least in our time zone yeah yeah we have some venture partners down in LA so that's nice so the top story this week show us your oculus too right. all right this thing is awesome the the first one was a toy this is a tool and they lowered the price to 299 uh, the resolution is fantastic they uh, spiced up the controllers a little bit. They're they're the same but different. The headset, unfortunately, they dropped the price a hundred dollars, and I think the strap basically took the hit. So, so uh, I'm, I'm doing the, the uh, I'm doing the live demonstration as you're talking about it, Joey. <laughs> I wish we could put up what you're looking at right now. But yeah, because I'm watching the pass through, which is wild. Like I'm looking at the black and white security camera with the weird offset. But it completely works. Like I'm in VR and I'm looking at old school on an iPad doing our Zoom chat. And I could actually be doing multiple things in VR while I'm watching this. It's kind of amazing. And, and an Oculus previous to the Quest 2 was discouraging people from using pass through and experiences. Yeah. And of course there are liability issues, right? You fall down the stairs and you know, so, suddenly Facebook's on the hook. The, um, that said, they're kind of changing that policy and supporting it uh, a little bit now. So even though the cameras aren't very good right now, again, I, I think a choice that was made in, in order to keep the price affordable, I, I think the potential for the cameras to get better and for pass-through, and <clears throat> again, pass-through means you're passing through a digital divide, whether it's a, a camera, you know, in this case, a camera screen. Uh, so any VR device with with outward facing cameras can do VR and AR, mm -hmm. and and the potentially go back and forth between VR and AR. I mean, I'm sure artists will surprise us with what they uh, do with that. So uh, that's an exciting aspect of it. I think um, as as you and I have referred to in the last couple of weeks, Charlie, the the biggest win, and of course you and I live in this bizarre world where we test these things early on and we start Man, to see, I use it every day. <laughs> yeah. We start to see where things are headed, but now that we actually have the commercial shipping versions of this thing, <laughs> we were right. The resolution of this device, albeit not exponentially higher than the first Quest, is good enough now that all the things you would just be really frustrated doing in this from like if you're looking at like high fidelity graphics, well, how about physics, just a Google Doc? everything right it just it's getting now we're getting into that good enough to use it for things that we wouldn't be able to use the first gen so it's a very viable pathway forward we're well, that's, really that's, that's why i said the first one was kind of a toy because 
while you could connect with colleagues, right. um, you know, your ability to design with it and your ability to really do work like collaboration as you would if you were physically present in a conference room was highly prescribed. But I think this is going to open up uh, enterprise quite a bit. And the fact that they've kept the price so low is amazing to me. Obviously, they're making enough money uh, off of their app store and off of people once they get a headset that they feel like they can do that. So Yeah, I also think that the, the money dynamic for Facebook, this is a long game for them. Yeah. So it's nice that they're demonstrating that developers are making money, that they're selling units at scale. But really, when they look at their internal economics of this, this is still very much small ball for them compared to their ad revenue and their other, all the stuff that they do, somewhat nefarious and somewhat not. But this is a long-term trajectory as they're starting to really understand how to migrate people through technology steps. And a few weeks ago, when they announced the first look-see at the research and development glasses, like glasses that you're wearing, they're really starting to show that they are in this for the long haul. They are committed and they are trying to validly compete with other tech giants, not just social media giants. So they're getting into the game with the likes of Microsoft and Apple. Um, and that's really interesting to watch. Yeah. Absolutely. The and they have the too. Sorry, go ahead, Amy. On the, on the software side too, right? They're really funding content as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, the things that I think about as we think about how virtual reality can get from a niche to being ubiquitous is for me, cost, content, and comfort, right? They've got the cost down. They're, they're supporting the content and they're trying to make it more comfortable and easier to use, um, you know. Do you guys think it's more comfortable than the last quest? No. Oddly enough, it is slightly less comfortable so far mm -hmm. um, because the strap is so light on the back that it's top heavy. Uh -huh. um, I think the, when we get the, the new straps, and I'm actually with a little startup working on a little piece that will actually counterweight this, you need to put a little stress on this and put a little weight on the back of your skull so that it starts to remove some of the top the, heaviness the elite, and then it'll be the solved. The battery strap has gotten very good reviews and I'm waiting for mine. Okay. And I think that'll resolve it. The elite battery strap, by the way, is 150 bucks. So yeah, it's not, it's not a small amount of money. It's almost as much as the device. It's kind of ridiculous, but you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have them because we need so presumably them. Power more, user needs them. more battery life and better comfort is what the strap yeah. is supposed to provide. I mean, for me, because I can always plug in, I'm not really all that like, not without a power source. It's really the back weight that I need more than the yeah. power. Um, so the, the thing that I have this small startup working on is going to be much lower cost and really just designed to get some of the weight off the front of your head. Useful. Yeah, we think yeah, so. Ab absolutely, especially as this is going to scale and it's very possible that uh, should Facebook smooth out its supply chain issues, this could really be the electronic uh, device of the Christmas season. You could see oh, them definitely. selling, you know, several million of these. I, I frankly, I'll be disappointed if they don't. I don't know what their internal projections are. Um, yeah, I think it will be in the millions. And I'd be, I'll, I think a lot of customers will be frustrated if their forecasting uh, is low and they didn't prepare, number one, for the complexities during the pandemic of Chinese sourcing of parts and, and final build. Right. Let's hope they got better than the first one because they yeah. did not predict how many people wanted a quest. No. Not even close, right? Uh, I was on a panel with Greg Castle from Anorak Ventures earlier this week. He was sure. saying that he had heard projections of six to eight million, and that's roughly the same as the first iPhone sales. Yeah, I would not be surprised if they get over six million of these. You know, at, at 300 bucks, like I, I was with people the other day from a safe distance, 10 feet apart, and they were like, that's really cool. How much is that? It's like $1,000? I'm like, yeah, 300 bucks. And they're like, $300? Mm -hmm. Wow. Like, can I go buy one of these? And I have to unfortunately yeah. say, you probably missed your first window. They're probably completely sold out till the next wave comes now, but put an order in and wait a month or two and hopefully you'll get one. That's uh, the unfortunate thing I have to tell them. There's, there's, you have to wait at the Oculus site now. Oculus itself doesn't have inventory. But, but Amazon told, does, right? Yeah, and I'm told that Target and Best Buy just got theirs and they're shipping. Oh, right, so they've got so, them, right. That and, they, and they're the same price everywhere. B&H just got yeah. theirs. I got an email from them. So uh, they're out and about. I don't think at the moment there's going to be a big crisis of inventory, but you could easily see Thanksgiving rolling around. So don't wait. If this is the, you know, device you're going to buy, to the hundred people listening to this podcast, I would get yours 
uh, your nephews now and stick it in the closet because um, right. when you really get down to the Christmas panic, you may not be able to get Charlie, it. what is, I just curiosity, what is the, the game you're looking forward to playing on this that you would play on your Rift with really good computer graphics? Because I have mine and I haven't done it yet and I'm really excited to do it. What, what, are, what are yours? Mine is Robo Recall. I think that has the best graphics of any VR game created yet. I think it has the best physics of any game created yet. And I, there, there's been a chasm between playing it on the Quest and on my, Rift, on my Rift S. But now with this, because the resolution is so good and the chip is better, I can't wait to see how close it is to like playing it on a 1080 in a, in a computer. And I'm really excited. That's my afternoon task after I come back to the beaches to play uh, Robo Recall. I've been, I've been using the Quest 2 with a um, with the data link. That, that yeah, you turns, use it with the, the plug, in, yeah. Into a rift. And uh, I mean, the resolution is sweet. Everything you look at looks more three-dimensional. Absolutely. And, and when there are variations in texture, um, that was hard to perceive before. Um, mm. And that subtlety, um, you know, so, so these worlds are very 3D. They were made in 3D. Um, but very often with the quest, the first quest, it was it came across as kind of flat because the you know low resolution has a flattening effect. Right. So now things are kind of popping. Yeah, they start to pop. And it's yeah. subtle, but but it definitely helps you feel immersed and present. What um, what I'm really curious about is because we know statistically that one of the most popular apps that is non-interactive are the different streaming services in their virtual theater, virtual living room. Like a lot of kids took an Oculus Go, that seems like ancient history, but because it was lightweight and it was kind of good enough to watch a movie on. And they would actually watch Netflix in their bedroom instead of watching on their iPhone on like this big screen. Now with this, you start to see the future. You start to see that there is a transitional device that can let you like, do things you would do in a traditional media world on something you can take with you on an airplane, something you could take with you when you're traveling and watch a virtual 15, 18, you know, 80 foot screen. And while it's not going to be as good as a 4K TV by a long throw yet, the screen door effect of the Quest 2 is remarkably better, remarkably less than the Quest 1. And you might actually want to, like, I never have enjoyed watching traditional media in a VR headset yet this might be the one for the first time where I'm going to watch a movie or watch a TV show on an airplane or, or in my, wherever I'm at as, as I'm on traveling now. Um, and actually say, I enjoyed it. Like I'm there. And now all it is is a matter of reducing the weight, creating the comfort, right? Creating the ergonomics, right? And you do have a new device, a new platform that can go mass scale because you have to bridge the past into the future, right? If you just go with the future, you'll get an audience. You just won't get a very large audience. That's, that's the interesting sort of use case of like, you've got to find a, a, the connective tissue. So we've got a lot to talk about this morning and unfortunately not a whole lot of time. Um, but I do want to talk about a couple things that uh, at least caught my attention this week. Uh, the first, although it seems like a small thing, I think is going to be a big thing. We were just talking about pass through uh, and Snapchat is a camera first company and, and almost everything they do uh, utilizes that concept of pass-through, combining the digital with the physical inside of the camera. So now they've taken a location, Canopy Street in London, and they've made a digital twin of it where they can append, you know, geolocated three-dimensional spatial images, effects, data that can be shared by an unlimited number of people from their unique perspective on the same street, which, yeah. you know, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. It's almost like I need to go to London to see this. Well, it's, it becomes a physical object that's just not really there, right? Like lots of people can look at it from their perspective as if it was a sculpture or a piece of art or a Burning Man thing or something. And this is that digital divide, right? We're starting to understand that lots of people in a group or in various group sizes can look at things from different perspectives as if they were really there in the real world. 
And this is what's starting to happen. It's like what Google Earth did in Gen 1 of this, they mapped the planet. So you and I could on this computer, on whatever we're on, go places in Google Earth and look at a street view. It's like, it's amazing, right? right. Now we're starting to get to the next level where we're blending the real world and the digital world in ways that will start to become imperceptible. And it's both fascinating and terrifying all at the same time. Amy, can you think of any other examples of this? Not at that scale, not at the city block scale. So what Snap's actually doing is they're using three degree, th th 360 degree images and snaps from their sourcing from their community to build this, this physical world. Before it was just buildings and now it's a, it's a whole city block. Um, I don't know anybody that's doing it at that scale. Well, I've always said that, you know, the world is going to be painted with right. pictures of food and selfies. Yeah. And so, although I don't think the canopy, um, the canopy uh, effect or, or location-based um, experience allows individual users to post in it, you can imagine when there's a world scale map that that's exactly what people will do. Pictures of food will be where they were taken. The selfies will be where they were taken. Uh, of course, there needs to be a whole system for detecting them. But um, I think that would, and by the way, I think that would be, you know, crazy cool, right? For well, you to go to the canyon and see that I had left a picture of myself and my kids there from 25 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that would be, you know, a social media for good. I think the word that will start to enter into the commonplace, let's call it over the next five to seven years, is the word anchoring. Like you and I understand this and people in the tech world understand where this is headed, but it's not in the mainstream yet. But over the next five years, people will understand, oh, that's anchored there. Like it's there. Like right. you could go back to it and your friends could add to the anchor. And it's like, it's a physical thing that's not actually physical. And that's going to start entering in, into our logic just like all the metaphors that this thing created in various ways, the words that we use to describe what we do with this, anchoring will be one of those words that people will like use in a very commonplace way, just like Google it, right? Like we don't say Yahoo it anymore, we say Google it, right? Um, and, and anchoring I think is gonna be one of those words that's like Kleenex, gonna stick with us for a while. So here's a big one that we should talk about, the iPhone 12. Mm, I got mine on order. Yeah, you've got yours on order. Oh, yeah. Um, it, Amy, why are people so excited about this? So the LiDAR technology that they had in the iPad is now in the iPhone. I mean, also, the, the other reason I'm particularly excited is the 5G integration, because to me, 5G is such a supporter of immersive content, because immersive content is so heavy. So just like 4G was that enabled video on phones, 5G will enable more uh, spatial AR and VR content on on a mobile device. So that that's the other reason I'm really excited. But I think those yeah, two are things, two, two things fun. about this really interest me. Uh, one is 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 lidar, of course, takes 3D spatial uh, mm -hmm. images. So when you take when you shoot something with a camera, you have the multiple ca the multiple lenses um, plus the lidar. Uh, combine to give you a 3D view of an object, a spatial object, and it's a type of photogrammetry. And, you know, we've never been able to capture the volume of a space before. We've always flattened it out to 2D. So you never knew, for example, looking in a forest, how deep it was. Um, so, you know, that, and, or that you could take that tree out of the picture and place it somewhere else. Right from a variety of angles. So I think what, that's super interesting. I think it could change what personal photography is. Yeah, what's interesting from our perspective is in my movie, movie studio life, we use high-end LIDAR, high-end photogrammetry to what we call hose down a set, or hose down a location, and we will capture all of that data field so we know physically where objects are and we can use them for VFX and all that work, right? Um, we started testing with the latest iPad which is still arguably a fairly small volume device compared to an iPhone. I mean, it's, they sell lots of them, but nowhere near as much as iPhones. And the form factor is a little tough because you know the smallest one is still like this. It's I don't know, 12 inches or something. So you're walking around like this. When you have a device that's this size and you can hose down something in the UGC world, right? In the low budget film world, like it just opens up this plethora of use cases that only 
professionals had access to because they were hundreds of thousands of dollars of specialized tool sets. Now you've got it in your daily use device, right? So it's just kind of like, like in the days of the first 4K camera that I had a hand in bringing to the world, only that many people had it, but it was democratically way more than film cameras. Then you got 4K in an iPhone, right? And now we're getting LiDAR level, photogrammetry level, depth sensing cameras in a mass, mass market device. And the world will be really interesting over the next couple of years as we see what happens with it. Not necessarily just from the big boys, but from the little boys, from all the folks doing UGC content that you're gonna be like, wow, that's incredible what they can do now with their phone, right? So it's gonna be really interesting. You know, here's, here's the other thing about it that I, I wanted to bring up, and it's really more about LiDAR than it is about the iPhone. Because I need to get that LiDAR on my desk, like a camera, mm -hmm. and Amy needs to get one, and you need to get one, and I need to put on my HoloLens, and, and then we start getting you the will be sitting in my office. Absolutely. And, you know, the killer apps and the things that drive media are always things that connect people to people. Right? It's why we look at our phones 400 times a day. Yep. And the idea that you could you, you know, combine the best thing about VR, which is physical presence, with the best thing about AR, which is its sort of ubiquitous passivity and capturing of the real and the digital in our everyday lives, uh, I think that could be the most impactful. The way we jump on Zoom now, we, we will be doing that in 10 years for Correct. sure. The evolution of this is we, Charlie, you and I, and I'm sure Amy, you do as well, because you're in this business as well, start to see this trajectory very clearly now. Like it was fuzzy, even for us five years ago. Like, yes. Now it's the clarity is starting, like we're starting to hone in on the target. Well, isn't that what always happens, right? I mean, you know, time changes everything. Five years, uh, you know, has passed very quickly. Uh, and, you know, it is, uh, you know, I'm always skeptical about these things. I always think, think things take longer and, and are much harder, um, you know, such as, you know, telepresence. Charlie, I know we've got a few, a few news stories to, to go through before time's out. And I want to make sure that I have at least enough time to ask Amy a very controversial question. So I just want to go. Wanna, go. Should, should we go to the controversial question that we've go, done with our news for, for the day? Yep. Okay. So Amy, this, this will be difficult to verbalize and it's threading the needle. So I wanna make sure I say this right. Um, when you talk about your fund and the work that you're doing as it's focused toward women in the field, uh -huh. one of my very diplomatic frustrations is are we still at a phase of the world where we have to call out the sex of who's doing what? So my example of this is at the very rare Magic Leap conference that happened a couple of years ago that Charlie and I went to, a lot of people went to, they had a lot of really smart people on stage and they were doing a lot of stuff. And when they started to call out the women that were going to give the speeches, they made this extra extraordinary point of saying, this is a woman and she's really successful and she's doing really good things in this field. And I was sitting back with my friends going, why do they need to make such a big, like- I thought I that was odd also. I thought that I know was, she's a woman. But I you know what it was about it? And I hate to say this, and I'm actually talking to Roni later today, yeah. but there was a self congratulatory aspect of it, which I found a little off-putting because it really communicated what they thought they were working against. Yeah. So Amy, I'm just curious if, you know, because you're, and, and look, I, we, we understand this is a, not an easy thing to discuss because we're calling out something that, but for people like us, we're like, I don't, I see people based on their talent and their use case. And I personally, and I think a lot of people in the tech field are far beyond like, what is the, the sex of the person doing it? And I'm just curious your perspective on it. Just an open question. Yeah, of course. Uh, happy to answer it in a I'm, I'm actually glad we're having this discussion. So um, I think the challenge is, is that there's still a very skewed amount of participation um, in terms of diversity and inclusion, not only gender, but 
but for race the, and everything uh, else, right? Yeah, age, that is that is a super age, age. and and accessibility and I, so I the reason that we're so excited and we're leaning into um, women in this space, but but really diversity in general is that you know in this new computing platform that we're talking about with a digital world on top and the and the spatial and right you, like having a diverse set of people create that content yeah, for the diverse set of people that we are as humanity is the best case scenario. And so leaning into supporting the diversity, I think is really important. Um, and we're not, and we're not there yet. So, so do I think it needs to be completely heavy handed? Oh my gosh, we're focusing women and here are huge panels of women and all of that sort of thing. No, but do I think that every panel should have think about diversity. I just got one from Reuters. It was four white men. Really? Right. Well, this is what's, what's interesting is that Charlie and I made a point, even though we have a little bit of frustration that we have to make the point, is so far, and we won't always do this, so far every one of our guest hosts, because we are, Charlie and I are sort of the same. We're the same age. We come from the same background. We're two white Jewish guys, right? And we just thought, we made a statement to each other saying, if we're going to have a guest host every week, what if we just focus on making it a woman? Wouldn't that be interesting? We'll, it'll add some diversity. It'll add a different voice. And so far, it's worked out pretty well. But at the same there, time, there are so many, so many powerful out, you know? women in, in XR. There really I think, are. I think it's great. I, I do think, you know, uh, it's funny because I always used to think that, that I was in pretty enlightened businesses in, in technology and entertainment, and there were always a lot of powerful women who work for me and yeah, me too colleagues. absolutely um so but uh, as my daughter pointed out how many of them were your boss um, so I, I think that the point that she's making is yes there are a lot of women in the workplace but where are they in the workplace right what is their level of influence and um you know influence on culture yeah. I, I do think from a cultural standpoint, we are in a better place than we were both uh, on inclusion, of both of race and gender. Uh, not every industry in every part of the country is the same. I think it's obviously highly variable how you might be treated. One person might be treated in Missouri than they would be treated in New York. Uh, that, that said, we're in a much better yeah. place. You know, people do not have to hide their sexuality, although there's plenty of um, prejudice against um, anything outside of the mainstream. It, it's still uh, way more normal than it was in, in the 60s and the 70s, where people, for example, who were obviously gay concealed it, you know, which is a, tra a personal tragedy that someone has to spend their life that way. You know, it's, it's a prison of sorts. And yeah, certainly I guess on race, we're, we're still very far away, although the implications there are so much bigger than any individual business. Right. You know, they're, they're really about how we educate people, how dollars are distributed by the federal government. There's so much institutional bias. Um, you know, I never had to swim upstream like that. Yeah, and I guess for me, from my perspective, I, what's important for me to learn is I have to separate my own personal experience to the general experience because my own personal experience is that i've actually always had women bosses women supervisors people that were of the opposite sex that i worked either as an equal with or they were my boss you know in the in the media and entertainment industry sorry we we had a um i had many you know female producers they were really good at their job and like it was good to work with female producers uh, and i still do that today and a lot of the executives at the movie studio are women and they're really strong and they're really good at what they do so i have a skew point right where i find it a little frustrating that we always have to call out that they're this but i now just in this five minute conversation i need to kind of remember that my personal situation is maybe not the norm Right. So it's more important for me to be aware of that. So that's that's valuable. Yeah. And thank you both for being allies. I mean, it, it's really important to have that in order to build this this diverse and inclusive ecosystem. So uh, really appreciate that. Well, that's a thank you, Amy. And this is a good place to end today. Um, it's always great every Friday morning to get with Ted and review the week. Um, I hope you guys will join us and do it again next week. Um, until then, um, good luck. And, yeah. and remember, um, 
this too shall pass. Going back in, baby. 